Hello, everyone. Welcome to the Mindscape Podcast. I'm your host, Sean Carroll. I don't know how many of you remember or have this recollection, but back in the early days of like blogging and social media, there was this question of whether or not there was still a place for science journalism in the world. Since after all, you had scientists who could now just start up their blog and talk about whatever it is they wanted to do. And the answer is yes, you still do need science journalists and you need political journalists and legal journalists and economic journalists. You need journalists who are experts in what they're doing. If only because professional journalists have an obligation to be fair, to think about everything that is going on in the field they're covering and explain it to the people who are reading or watching or listening in an unbiased, overarchingly fair way. Whereas the individual researchers, they're going to talk about what they personally think is cool. So in fact, I think you need both. It's great to have professional researchers being able to reach broad audiences in uh, whatever way they can. You also need professional journalists to set a wider stage and make sure that nothing falls between the cracks. So I say this because I'm a person who is a professional researcher, but I also have you know public outreach, public-facing aspects of what I do, including this podcast, Mindscape. And I have a weak spot for speculative, big-picture, conceptual kinds of things, right? The origin of the universe, the nature of life, what intelligence or complexity are, the foundations of quantum mechanics, stuff like that. And I say this because I hope people don't get the impression that most of science is like that, because it really isn't. I happen to be interested in that stuff, but most of science, and really, really good, important, fun, exciting parts of science, are much more grounded, right? They're much more close to the data, to known laws of physics. You can know the fundamental laws of physics, and that still leaves an enormous amount unknown in terms of how those laws play out whether it's in biology or, for that matter, in nuclear astrophysics. <laughs> and that's what we're talking about today, nuclear astrophysics. You might wonder what the intersection of those two words is. Astrophysics, of course, the whole universe, stars, galaxies, etc. Well, where did those nuclei come from that make up the heavier elements that make up you and me and the Earth and things like that? From astrophysics, from stars mostly, but as we will see, not only from stars. So our guest today is Sanjana Curtis, who is an astrophysicist at UC Berkeley, and she is a nuclear astrophysicist. She studies how heavier elements are created in stellar explosions and other environments in the universe. She's also extremely effective as an outreach communication person. She started a new TikTok series, believe it or not. I can't do this. I'm too old for that. But Sanjana is, is hip to what the kids like these days. And she started a series called Stardust that in little tiny TikTok videos, but very carefully produced, explains the principles of nuclear astrophysics and, because it's fun and cool, goes into how those elements that you make in the stars show up in different ways here on Earth. So you can hear about uh, biology, you can hear about archaeology, you can hear about all sorts of fun things that these nuclei end up in here on Earth, as I said, in very grounded scientific context. And I have to say, as someone who was an undergraduate and graduate student in astronomy, nuclear astrophysics is super cool. You know, the story of how all of the elements in the periodic table get to be made over the history of the universe is almost suspiciously rich. <laughs> you know, you, you might think, if you were thinking like a physicist, that there was a mechanism that made all the elements, you know, maybe 99% of them, and then there were some little tiny things. But, but that's not how it actually is. There are many different channels, different mechanisms in the universe, from the Big Bang to cosmic rays to supernovae and more, that all are important for explaining where the different elements in the periodic table came from. So this is a little bit of a journey through real-world astrophysics, real-world in the sense that we have data and are testing our theories, but not that we know all the answers yet. As you'll see, there's some good questions still remaining. So let's go. Uh, 
Angela Curtis. Welcome to the Mindscape Podcast. Thank you. I'm really excited to be here, Sean. As I just said, as we were talking before, this is one of the rare pleasures for me where I get to... Sorry, Mindscape fans, I know this is audio only to you, but a very cute kitty cat just walked in front of Sanjana here in the, yes. in the video. So we get That's my cat, that Cinnamon. Get. She has to make an appearance at these things. Whenever my I cats start talking, are, are in the here. back on the floor. My, my, my two cats are very ground-based cats. They do not jump up uh, very easily. So anyway, uh. Uh, as I was saying, uh, this is a happy occasion for me because we get to talk about something I know a little bit about, but I will you know try to channel the people who don't know anything about it. So let's start super duper simple. We're interested in how elements are made. Um, what are these elements of which you speak? Tell us a little bit about the periodic table, how it works, how we should think. We've all seen it, but you know, how should we conceptualize it? How should we look at it and get things out of it? Right. So uh, the periodic table, all the 118, I believe, elements the origin of those elements is what we're interested in the field of nuclear astrophysics. And the way I think about it usually is in terms of the astrophysical sites that operated and created new nuclei and how sort of the periodic table builds up as a result of those uh, astrophysical uh, nuclear reactions at, in various astrophysical sites. And so for example, you have the lighter elements, hydrogen and helium. There's a particular type of nucleosynthesis that produces those. And then when you're looking at things like carbon and oxygen, elements that are essential to life, there's really stars that are doing nuclear reactions to make those. And then you start thinking about the iron group of elements, so iron and copper and zinc. And there you need really energetic supernova explosions. And then you go even heavier and there's even uh, less of those elements, uh, generally speaking, uh, in the universe. And things like gold, our precious elements, come from an entirely different type of nucleosynthesis site. So in my mind, I think of it, the periodic table in terms of the different astrophysical processes and sites that have built it up. That's great. And just to be super duper clear, nuclear astrophysics being your central concern means that you don't actually care about atoms. It's <laughs> it's just the nuclei that matter to you. I mean, the periodic table is organized on the basis of the chemical structure. And, That's and you're, right. not, yeah. you're not into the whole chemical no, thing. No, not so much. So the second molecules begin to matter... Uh, that's not really my realm of interest. Of course, I'm interested in it as any human being is right. and as chemists are in terms of the properties of the atoms themselves and, you know, where you have metals and nonmetals and noble gases and metalloids. So uh, the, the various columns of the periodic table tend to share certain properties, things like that. That's not really uh, my research. My research is more about how these elements came to exist at all. Exactly, right. And there's a long-standing joke among non-astronomers how astronomers count elements by going hydrogen, helium, metals. <laughs> but but you yes. don't get to do that, right? Anything heavier than, than helium is a metal for most astronomers. <laughs> yes, that's exactly correct. And that's just how we think of uh, uh, metallicity, which is a quantity. It's just the amount of metals. And it's just anything that's not hydrogen or helium is, is a metal to me. I'm sure chemists are not a fan of this kind of nomenclature, and I completely sympathize. The other thing, just to get our audience on the on the right uh, wavelength here, I bet a lot of people think that the universe is almost all hydrogen or maybe almost all helium. I mean, how much do the other elements, the metals, et cetera, matter to the evolution of the universe in terms of stars, galaxies? Blowing right. Up things. Oh, they they matter quite a lot. I mean, it, it is correct to say that most of uh, uh, the stuff in the universe, uh, the baryonic matter, anyway, is hydrogen and helium. Um, but but the way uh, stars form and then explode and injects energy as well as new elements really shapes how galaxies evolve, uh, just by changing the properties of the material that you're looking at. Um, and also the energetics. So a supernova can can shove material out of a galaxy even, potentially. And so it really matters in terms of when you're starting to think of the nuclear history of the universe, uh, how structures formed, 
it really matters how stars formed and interacted with everything and the feedback uh, of those. I, I bet that a lot of how we get an image of the universe comes from the pictures that we get of it. And there's still pictures generally, right? Which makes sense because yeah. the timescale on which these things happen, the timescale on which a galaxy effectively evolves is much longer than a human lifetime. But right. it does evolve. And I think maybe this is an important thing to get across that if you took a time lapse of a galaxy, which we can't do, but if you did, there'd be all sorts of churning and exploding and interesting things happening. Yeah, so there's actually this field called galactic archaeology. Um, and so you can almost think of astronomers as archaeologists. Uh, as we look at older and older stars or older galaxies, we can kind of get snapshots of what was going on uh, a long time back in the universe. And then we come to present day and the solar system itself. Okay, well, let's do exactly that then. I think that we can start at the Big Bang. Um Tell us a little bit, as a nuclear astrophysicist, how do you think about the whole phrase, the Big Bang, and, and its aftermath? <laughs> yeah, so as a nuclear astrophysicist, uh, the part of the Big Bang that I begin to get interested in is once the Big Bang has occurred and now the universe has mostly quarks and gluons, and as it expands and cools, neutrons and protons begin to condense out. And of course, there's a lot of nuclear reactions happening, and uh, a lot of it depends on the temperatures and the way radiation is interacting with the matter. But uh, sort of broadest strokes, you have neutrons and protons beginning to condense out very short time scale after yeah. the Big Bang. And then you end up with a certain fraction of neutrons versus protons, and this kind of thing is important for what kind of elements you can make. But basically, maybe seconds after the Big Bang or so, the elements that are produced are hydrogen, helium, teensy bit of lithium. So this is all that really comes out of Big Bang nucleosynthesis. And now you have a universe full of hydrogen and helium. And then we can begin to form stars out of that. And then that's the portion that's where my active research uh, area is, is uh, basically stars and supernovae and the aftermath of those. Yeah. So it's kind of an interesting race, as I understand it, because if you have a hot but not too hot box of, of plasma, you would like to make iron, right? Isn't that the yes. uh, the curve of binding energy? Maybe maybe That's fill right. us in that story. Yeah, yeah. So um, the, the the binding energy really wants uh, wants everything to be iron fifty six. Um, however. Um, the, the Big Bang nucleus synthesis, okay, the, te the temperatures and the densities that exist, exist during uh, Big Bang nucleus synthesis are not conducive to having this whole set of nuclei being produced. And also, there's a funny thing where there's a gap in stable nuclei. Um, so it's very difficult for Big Bang nucleus synthesis to produce lithium, beryllium, and boron. So okay. these three elements don't really, well, there's a tiny bit of lithium, but uh, there's a gap there where there's not a lot of stable isotopes uh, that you can get at uh, in the nuclear reactions that are possible to occur in Big Bang nucleosynthesis. So what needs to happen really is you want to be fusing all this helium that you've made to make carbon. But to do that, you really need the conditions that exist in stars. I think I remember that George Gamow and his friends, when they were inventing Big Bang nucleosynthesis, really hoped that they were going to be, make, be able to make the entire periodic table. But basically, the universe just expands too fast and cools off, and there's not enough time for yeah. the reactions to happen. Exactly. Yeah, yeah. So, I mean, the reaction rates, uh, and, and even making the carbon uh, in stars, that had to be really figured out to get to the uh, correct state of beryllium Mm. Um, you need to hit enough, uh, you need to fuse two hydrogen, uh, helium nuclei to make beryllium. And then you need to hit it with another helium to get to carbon. And so then uh, it's a very uh, sensitive thing where you need to have enough beryllium that's not decayed away uh, right. and still have, uh, uh, have a reaction rate that gets you that carbon. Because it is very intricately connected to the specifics of nuclei and how heavy they are, because you can't just 
take a helium and add one more proton to it and one more proton to it and one more proton to it. No, no. So yeah, <laughs> I, I mean, you can add a proton to the helium, but then what you end up with is an unstable isotope of maybe beryllium, as I, and then it very quickly will decay away. And so right. there's nothing, uh, uh, nothing that you can really do with that. So you're stuck coming out of the Big Bang with a bunch of hydrogen and helium. Yes. And and then I guess you make stars. So is when I was in graduate school, which was a long time ago, the whole process by which stars were made was still pretty murky, I think, in the minds of astrophysicists. Yeah. And, and interestingly, in the late universe, it does seem to care about the existence of heavier elements. They're very useful for making stars. So... How does that even happen? Do we know how you make stars in the, the first generation where it's just hydrogen and helium? <laughs> That's a really interesting topic, but it, it is similar to what you said, where we don't really have a clear answer yet. So, for example, something that you might call the initial mass function of the first stars, mm. meaning uh, if you were to bin these stars by mass, how much... Uh, how many stars have like 10 times the mass of the sun or how many of them have 100 times of the mass of the sun. Um, and people have done, uh, and this is a, a sort of broad strokes knowledge that I've gained from reading other people's papers, um, is uh, if you do these simulations, and yes, metals are important for cooling and uh, the way things evolve, th there are different predictions for what should happen. So some people think that you might end up with stars that are hundreds of times the mass of the sun, and those stars will undergo um, not core collapse supernovae, which I study, but something called pair instability supernovae. Oh. Um, and then uh, those particular supernovae have a very specific nucleosynthetic signature. Or you might you might end up with low mass stars as well. So it's it's really not very clear what the masses of these stars are going to be um, when you form the first generation of stars. And ne nor have we observed a star that's a population three star. Right. Astronomers yeah. count stars backwards, so the population three is the first population that's right. chronologically. Right. Yes. I mean, they count from fun, us. You know? <laughs> <laughs> it makes sense. They count from the present day. They count backwards. So... I know that some people, like Katie Fries, have suggested that dark matter actually plays a big role in forming that first generation of stars. I have no idea yeah. whether that's plausible or not. Uh, I guess it, it would have to do with the way, um, gal like the halos form, and then the galaxies are born in those halos. And so I'm sure there's an interplay, but I am not sure how that I goes. I don't think anyone is. Okay, that's fair. Okay, so. Yeah. We get some stars. Um, do we at least know when, like how many years after the Big Bang, that first generation really comes to life? There were dark ages, right? Uh, yes, yeah, the after... dark ages, and then there's this epoch of reionization. I don't know if I have the number off the top of my head. Z something. Uh, but a, you might but a know long time than me, after to be that. Honest. A long time after the first minute when we did Big Bang nucleosynthesis. There's a long yeah, stretch when yeah. it was There's just hydrogen and There's a long stretch of the dark ages, and helium. yes, yeah. and then okay. stars form, yeah. And then, good, now we can make the heavier elements, right? I mean, so the short lesson here, uh, if, if people are going to stop listening right now, most of the elements are made in stars, not in the Big Bang. And there's some miscellaneous ones made by even cooler mechanisms, but it's stars doing most of the work for anything heavier than helium. That's right. Stars and uh, even stellar corpses, so neutron stars, um, right. are doing the right. rest of the work. Okay, so what's the first thing that happens in the newly stelliferous universe that, that uh, spurts heavier elements out there into the cosmos? Oh, the first thing that happens, I mean... One, one could argue it's these pair instability supernova. So what does that mean, a pair instability supernova? Okay, so the pair instability supernova are basically um, stars hundreds of times the mass of the sun, where in their core, the conditions are such that you can reach a regime where runaway pair production basically begins to happen. So pair production meaning that uh, you have electrons and positrons colliding together to make gamma rays. Okay. Um, and that reduces um, uh, the radiation pressure. And so it goes, uh, sorry, when the ga gamma rays collide to also do the opposite reaction, that reduces the radiation pressure uh, in the core of the star. And the radiation pressure is what's keeping it up. Um, and so 
when this parent stability is encountered, the core of the star begins to uh, basically lose all support and it will trigger nuclear reactions as it collapses and the whole star blows up. This is kind of fascinating. Like I, I'm going to confess right here to all the millions or hundreds of millions of Mindscape listeners, I did not really know about this kind of supernova. So you have a big yeah. star, much, much bigger than the sun, and it's held up by radiation pressure. So literally the photons that are being made inside are keeping up yes. the star. And the, yes. it gets so intense that the photons start bumping into each other and making electron-positron pairs. That's which right. lowers the pressure and the star collapses. Uh, yes, and, and the star collapses and then... Uh, as the temperatures and densities rise, you get nuclear reactions happening, and that kind of undergoes a runaway because the star continues to collapse. So the the pair instability has nothing to do with the star splitting in two. It's uh, no, gamma rays, it's, it's really... photons making pairs. Yeah. 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 And is this we we've heard of things like type one, type two supernovae and things like that. Is this one of those? This is a separate category. Separate supernova. category. So entirely. this is a, a type of supernova that's kind of a theoretical, mm -hmm. uh, a very theoretically motivated supernova. But uh, to my knowledge we have not observed a supernova light curve that we might say, look, this is a pair instability supernova. Uh, these explosions are meant to be very, very energetic. And so it could be that they produce a particular class of supernovae called superluminous supernovae. Mm -hmm. um, and so they're, they're, as the name suggests, way more luminous than your standard type one, type two supernova. Okay, um, cool. I, I feel so a little bit less bad be, now. Yeah. Um, and the latest kind of uh, thing on that is people look for signatures of nucleosynthesis in these parent stability supernovae in old stars to kind of show that they might have occurred. Mm -hmm. um, so it's it's something that's not been observed yet, but from the theory side has a strong motivation that should exist. And is the general idea that when these stars explode and... Uh, populate the region around them with heavier elements. Were those heavier elements already there, having been um, created in the center of the star, and they're just being mixed into the environment, or are they actually being created in the explosion? Yeah, so they are being created in the explosion, um, as well as there's some material that uh, some of the elements were already created during the life of the star. So uh, in a supernova, uh, what comes out is a mixture of what we would call the hydrostatic nucleosynthesis. So nucleosynthesis that happened when the star was happily fusing hydrogen to helium, to carbon, to oxygen. And then uh, explosive nucleosynthesis. So really um, elements that were produced during the explosion itself by, say, explosively burning oxygen to silicon. Burning being here used in a very loose in sense. In the nuclear, uh, nu yes. Nuclear in fusion the nuclear sense. Right. sense, okay. yes. Okay, so I, that, that was a very helpful to me discussion of the pair instability supernovae, but they're not the most common ones, like you said. So what are, what are the yeah. kinds of supernova explosions that are really doing the heavy lifting uh, metal-wise? Right, so uh, the core collapse supernovae uh, are one of the big ones, and uh, especially early in the history of the universe. Um, core collapse supernovae are explosive deaths of stars that are uh, ten, more than 10-ish times the mass of our sun. And so these stars are able to fuse uh, hydrogen to helium to carbon to oxygen all the way to making an iron core. And as you touched on before, because of the binding energy of iron, um, it's no longer uh, possible to fuse iron to generate energy and keep the core of the star um, uh, stable. Right. And so then um, the, the, once the iron core grows to a certain mass, the core begins to collapse. And there's a whole sequence of uh, a complicated sequence of events that occurs for this collapse to turn into an explosion. Mm -hmm. um, of the star. And so those are core collapse supernovae. Uh, they're also, um, so if people are familiar with the observational categories of type 1 and type 2, um, uh, type 1, B, and C, as well as type 2 supernovae are core collapse supernovae. Oh, that's very messy. So just, we'll get yeah. to them later, but you got to fill in what type 1A is. Oh, yes. So then the type 1As are basically um, 
very interesting uh, explosions of white dwarfs. I'm saying this very carefully yep. because <laughs> one of the things that uh, we don't know for sure is um, the progenitor systems of type 1A supernovae. So is it a, it's some sort of an explosion of a white dwarf, but it, what is, is it a Chandrasekhar mass white dwarf or is it a sub Chandrasekhar mass white dwarf? Um, there's some sort of binary here where the white dwarf uh, is either merging with another white dwarf to create uh, this thermonuclear explosion. That's really the dis uh, the distinction. This is it's a thermonuclear explosion. Um, and then, uh, or is it some sort of main sequence star that's the companion of the white dwarf that it's accreting material from, and then that's triggering a runaway thermonuclear reaction of the white dwarf. So uh, the progenitor system of, uh, of these has been sort of an open question, and many people have many ideas on how exactly the stars blow up and what exactly is the binary that we're looking at. And among other reasons, the reason why we need to understand this is because these type 1a supernovae were the first evidence for dark energy. That's right. The Trying to constrain the expansion rate of the universe uh, relies on, on, is it the Phillips relation, I believe? Yes, uh, that's right. How you can standardize the light curves of type 1a supernovae. Yeah, I, I think this is, uh, since I was an astronomy undergraduate and graduate student, I'm, I've am i seen this up close, but it's kind of miraculous to me that we can say so many true things about these systems in the universe without truly knowing what they are or what's going on, right? <laughs> I know, it's, it's a bit unnerving, but it's also amazing. <laughs> okay, so I think we'll get back to the type 1a supernova, the, the white dwarfs exploding. But, but let's say more about the core collapse supernova. I think I'm going to yeah. guess roughly that this is what most people have in the back of the minds when they think of a supernova. It's sort of That's right. used up all its fuel, it collapses, and then it bounces. And right. then what happens? There's a lot of nuclear reactions going on. It's, it's, it's a, a very intricate thing. Yeah. I mean, uh, this is full employment for people like you. Yeah, yeah. Lots of nuclear reactions going on, a lot of uh, nuclear physics going on, even with particles like neutrinos. Um, and so it is it is truly messy, but that's kind of the fun of it, too. Um, so the, the general uh, sort of schematic picture um, is that the iron core begins to collapse. Uh, however, it does not collapse uh, indefinitely. So at some point, uh, you hit very, very high densities, nuclear densities in the core as the core collapse proceeds. And around this point, um, the repulsive part of the strong nuclear force kicks in mm -hmm. and it sort of uh, tries to stop the collapse. And what happens as a result is uh, the portion of the core begins to turn into a neutron star and it finds a new stable configuration. And so it sort of goes back into this sort of stable configuration that results in a bounce shock, what is what you would call, and that bounce shock begins to go through the rest of the iron core and kind of um, goes out and out and it, it's breaking up uh, the iron that's already been created during this, the life of the star into uh, smaller nuclei. Uh, mm -hmm. as it does so. So it's uh, going through the core, um, but it's also losing energy as it does so. And so um, sort of it goes out a certain distance into the star and it begins to stall. And this has been uh, for decades, the core collapse supernova explosion mechanism problem is how do you get the shock that was launched as a result of uh, the collapse to actually continue going through the rest of the star and blow up the star. Okay. So um, this stalled shock issue um, and the answer that a lot of people are looking at and it's sort of working now uh, in multidimensional simulations of core collapse supernovae is uh, you have to rely on neutrinos heating right. the material behind <laughs> the shock. And uh, Yes. So as this neutron star is forming, it's so hot and a lot of uh, uh, reactions are happening and you have a flux of these subatomic particles called neutrinos coming out of the neutron star. And they're carrying away a lot of the energy, energy of the collapse. And so 
if you can get even a little bit of the neutrino energy to deposit, so for these neutrinos to interact with the material that is behind the supernova shock and deposit their energy there, uh, you can re-energize the shock and get the explosion to occur. And so this is a neutrino-driven mechanism of core collapse supernovae that uh, most people agree is sort of working. And it is kind of fascinating because we, we are told, if we hang out on the wrong street corners, that, you know, the sun <laughs> is emitting neutrinos and they're passing through our bodies all the time, but they, you know, they just interact yeah. so weakly that they're irrelevant. Uh, right. But this is an example of where they're super relevant just because the energies are so high, the densities are so high, yeah. neutrinos doing a lot of the work. Yeah, it, it, that's amazing. And this is this is actually the thing that everybody asks me. The first time I say the neutrinos interact because, you know, the fun fact that we all <laughs> grow up with is neutrinos are passing through your hand and trillions mm -hmm. of them pass through you and you just never know uh, because they so rarely interact. But here is uh, 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 the sort of extreme of nature where the densities and the energies and the temperatures make it so neutrino matter interactions become very important. And we saw the neutrinos from Supernova 1987A back uh, back in the day. That's right. Were you uh, were you sort of in the field then? Is that is, I was a you... undergraduate when that happened. Oh my so god! I was not How really amazing. in the field, no, but it was very exciting. Yeah, uh, yeah. we're not around yet. Wow. But yeah. <laughs> and we've been waiting ever since for uh, for anything like it. But yeah, whatever. I don't know, two dozen neutrinos that were It's a small number across. of neutrinos. The, the number of neutrinos is much smaller than the number of papers written about those neutrinos. Let's, <laughs> let's put it that way. But we, but like That's you say, right. we're preparing. We have a whole network ready if another supernova goes off yes. in our galaxy or, or mm -hmm. nearby. So yeah, that would be very yeah. exciting. So do these neutrinos help us with making heavier elements? Do they play a role there? They do play a role. So... Um, Making heavier elements, uh, once you begin to get to maybe the upper ion group of elements, things are a little bit fuzzier. And once you get beyond zinc, they're even fuzzier in terms of exactly what's going on in a core collapse supernova. So for the longest time, people thought that you can make, um, maybe you can make everything up to zinc and even beyond. So your gallium and germanium and gold and platinum in a core collapse supernova. But um, as we've studied these more and simulated them more and actually tried to do the neutrino physics correctly, uh, it does not seem as though they produce any substantial amounts of the very heavy elements. So core collapse supernovae uh, may be able to produce uh, maybe elements a, a, a little bit beyond zinc, but not, not the too, too heavy elements. Um, and neutrinos matter here because... Uh, Neutrinos, due to uh, as they get absorbed and emitted, they change the neutron to proton ratio of the material, and the neutron to proton ratio is something that's really critical um, mm -hmm. in terms of making heavier elements. Because beyond a point to make heavy elements, you have to capture neutrons. Right. Uh, when you have too many protons in the nucleus, it's no longer uh, favorable to be capturing another neutron, uh, another proton on top of that. So neutron capture produces a lot of the truly heavy elements. And whether you have enough neutrons to capture or not, that becomes the question. Okay, so there's that that it sounds like there's a lot of uncertainty still in where sufficiently heavy elements come from. I mean, just just so people know what's going on here, iron is uh, 26 protons, if I'm remembering correctly. So and that's where that's like the lowest energy that that protons and neutrons can settle into. So anything heavier than that, you had to do some work to make it. Yeah. And, and you mentioned, I guess, zinc, which is just a little bit beyond iron. Uh, yes, that's right. So uh, if you have uh, some amount of uh, neutron-rich material, it's possible to make zinc, um, but it's it's just uh, it's a lot of balancing, a lot of different reactions uh, at the end of the day and the cross sections of those reactions. Um, so you can get a little bit, a little bit beyond iron, but to truly go much higher, you need to because we even do go much help. higher. Like lead is like eighty-two protons or something yes. like that, and that comes from the yeah. universe, right? Yeah, the so zinc is is thirty, so yeah. <laughs> that's that's where I'm uh, stopping. Uh, but even for zinc, there's a lot of uncertainty 
uh, in terms of where it came from, all of the zinc in the universe. But so should, should I think of then like these iron and iron adjacent elements as mostly coming from uh, core collapse supernova? Uh, actually, mostly coming from type 1A supernova. Oh, okay. All right. So well, let, let me, let's talk about their role then, maybe. It's a combination of uh, of these two that really produces most of the iron group elements. It seems like a weird coincidence. I, I, I shouldn't presume. Both kinds of supernovae, the core collapse supernovae and the type 1A supernovae, are playing a role in making iron and, and heavier than iron elements. Uh, in making iron, and heavier than iron is, uh, is mostly then... Um, it, it really depends. The balance really depends. Once you get to nickel and zinc, uh, there's a lot of um, uncertainty there. Some people think that they have to be made through maybe a neutron capture process, like the S process. What is or, that? Okay. Okay. So for making heavy elements, there's two types of neutron capture processes that people think about. One is um, at the slow neutron capture process, or the S process. And the other is the rapid neutron capture process, the R process. And it is what it kind of sounds like. Uh, <laughs> uh, basically, when you capture a neutron, uh, you make an unstable isotope. And then you can undergo a beta decay. And then uh, you end up with basically uh, something that's one proton heavier, a nucleus that's one proton heavier. So if you capture one neutron and you undergo a beta decay. You've made a new element. That's so beta plus decay one. is the neutron is decaying into a proton. The the nucleus that has captured a neutron is decaying into Good. a nucleus with a plus one proton. Fair enough. And so then it's uh, then it's the question of how quickly can you capture neutrons versus how quickly is the beta decay happening. So if you're very slowly capturing neutrons, you mm. kind of stick close to the stable elements and sort of have a very nice little ladder that you're climbing very close to stable elements, and that's the slow neutron capture. Um, and this is believed to happen in sort of lower mass stars in uh, in the envelopes of like AGB stars or something like uh, like that. So slow neutron capture can happen. What is in, an AGB uh, star? Uh, an a asymptotic giant branch star. So basically... Uh, a, a lowish mass star can still make heavy elements. It's just a completely different process that's happening, the slow neutron capture process. The rapid neutron capture process, the R process, that's where you capture a whole bunch of neutrons and you uh, beta decay back to truly heavy elements. So uh, you move very, very far away from the stable elements in terms uh -huh. of making isotopes that have just a uh, complete have been engorged almost their nuclei have been engorged with neutrons and then they're going to undergo beta decay back to stability uh, to make heavy elements and this our process is where um, so this is part of my research also so core collapse supernovae and our process in uh, neutron uh, star mergers or neutron star black hole mergers so there you do need something that's a bit more extreme you need a, a very high uh, number of neutrons um, to to enable the R process, basically. Can, can you just give us a, a quick feeling then how much of the heavy elements we see around us actually didn't come from explosions at all, but just from like really uh, very persistent grunt work on the part of these low mass stars? Yeah, so it goes about half and half I th uh, in terms of uh, the heavy elements, uh, but it differs from uh, element to element as well. So there are elements that you can't actually access by doing the S process. And so they are R process only. And there's also something called the P process, uh, <laughs> the proton <laughs> capture process. This is this okay. is the thing, you know, people think that this is the broad stroke of the periodic table. Okay, it's solved. You know, what else is there to right. figure out? No one is, is going to come away from this all. thinking that. But <laughs> But then the other thing that you mentioned that I didn't want to let go by is um, th that I don't think everyone uh, is familiar with. It's not just exploding stars. Um, it's not either 
core collapse supernovae or white dwarfs uh, accreting from their backgrounds and exploding. There's the, this you know important whole other phenomenon of coalescence of stars, whether yes. it's a neutron, two neutron stars, neutron stars, black holes, and and maybe again, I'm just thinking people's intuitive picture of the universe, maybe people don't appreciate how often that happens. Yeah, yeah. The the rates of these events are another big uncertainty that people are trying to get at through these gravitational wave detections. Mm -hmm. So we're narrowing it down slowly. But yes, um, um, how much heavy element, how much of uh, heavy elements are produced in one neutron star merger? combined with the rates of these events actually gets you um, to present day abundances of heavy elements. Yeah. So what exactly happens in the in the process of two neutron stars merging? Yeah. So uh, the neutron star binary has formed is the point where I will start because there's yeah. a lot to understand in terms of binary <laughs> style, stellar evolution as well. Uh, but the binary exists and the stars are sort of uh, losing some of their um, uh, losing energy through gravitational wave radiation and spiraling towards each other. And so at some point, and this will take eons um, to be a vague, uh, at some point, the stars will, uh, will get so close to each other that they will begin to rip each other apart. So neutron stars are going to start tidally disrupting each other and merge together. Um, and so as this happens, uh, some of the material will get thrown out of the system in mainly the equatorial region uh, through tidal forces. There's also, depending upon, um, um, depending upon kind of the way these stars shear against each other, uh, there's going to be additional physical processes going on. There's uh, maybe shock heated ejecta in the polar region. Um, and so there's there's many ways as these stars merge together that they will throw material out into uh, into space. And once they merge together, what happens is also uh, this post merger evolution is a big open, uncertain uh, area that people are studying. And so depending upon the masses of the neutron stars, you might get a remnant that's so massive that it will collapse to form a black hole. And so if you have um, uh, if you have a black hole, it could just be a black hole or it could be a black hole with an accretion disk of material around it. And that accretion disk also has a lot of important physics going on with respect to magnetic fields and turbulence and uh, just viscous heating. And so that accretion disk also ejects material and it can unbind over a certain amount of time. Part of it gets accreted by the black hole. Part of it gets ejected into the, uh, into the, uh, into the space. Uh, and so long story short, the neutron stars merge together. They form either a black hole, a black hole with an accretion disk, or they form a third possibility where, uh, depending upon the masses of the neutron stars and uh, the way angular momentum is being transported, uh, it, you can end up with a temporarily stable neutron star. And so a short-lived neutron star that has its own set of processes of mass ejection and eventually collapses to form a black hole, black hole with a disk around it. So there, there's a lot of channels through mm -hmm. which um, the binary might go after merging together. For the nu for nucleosynthesis purposes, this whole time, whatever is going on, material is being ejected from the system, and all of this material has different types of properties conducive to making different types of elements. And again, the I shouldn't say again in this case, are neutron stars 100% neutrons or do they have an atmosphere <laughs> where there are protons as well yeah so they're not a hundred percent neutrons they're they're largely neutrons but there's some uh structure to them as well um and uh i think they're i think it's questionable what percentage protons are there but that's so i guess a, a very naive question or worry that one might have that i can already see the answer to is how do you make nuclei if all you have are neutrons don't you need protons too but i guess the decaying takes care <laughs> the of that decaying, pretty quickly yeah yeah exactly yeah <laughs> and so 
it, but I would I would guess and less naively that if I start with just a bunch of neutrons, I'm going to be making light elements again. I'm going to start from you know one or two neutrons at a time. So how do I work my way all the way up to? Uh, I, am I working my way all the way up to very heavy elements this way? You are. You are. So um, there's. I mean, this is going to be too convoluted to get into. But the basic idea is you'll form you'll form elements up to iron. And those will serve as seed nuclei, what you can call a seed nuclei, for neutron capture to make the even heavier elements. And so that's what's going on. It's kind of, um, um, yes, you start out with some um, fraction of neutrons and protons. And then you, depending upon the temperatures and the densities and the interaction rates, you form some fraction of heavier um, elements. And then there's still a lot of neutrons remaining. And then you can capture onto those, um, uh, say, iron to, to make things like gold. Um, of course, like it's not one to one and you go through a b bunch of intermediate nuclei. Uh, uh, it's, it's really the when you think about a nucleus synthesis, there's this whole uh, set of two body, three body nuclear reactions that are possible. And depending upon the temperature and the density and the electron fraction and the entropy, the rates of these reactions are different, and um, so you have to you have to. But uh, for neutron capture, you can just think about it in terms of maybe the number of seed nuclei that are produced, and then uh, the neutron to seed ratio. Hmm. Okay. So this is actually <laughs> again, I'm going to admit, it's super helpful. I've never quite understood this stuff. So, uh, no. as a cosmologist, I understand the Big Bang thing, and there, right. you, know, you make your helium, and then you dilute away so much that there's not really enough time to do anything else. Here, it, I guess, you're saying that there's enough density, and it's it's packed into enough place that you are able to get up to iron. And yeah. once you have iron in this super neutron-rich environment, you can just grow, right? You can just, like yes, you say, exactly. grab a neutron, beta decay, grab another neutron, and, and climb up the ladder. Yeah, climb up the ladder, yeah. But that, okay, I've oversimplified it because I'm betting that, in fact, you have some incredibly intricate reaction network that you have to put on a computer. <laughs> <laughs> yes, it's thousands and thousands of isotopes. And, you know, we can, uh, to try to understand them, we sit and make these... Uh, movies where you can see uh, the flux of one element churning into another element or the flux of the, the reaction uh, rate basically from one element to another element and kind of um, and as you watch this movie you'll see it just goes absolutely bonkers um, uh, in the way things are interacting of course there's like um, some reactions that are that are way more favorable than others, but there is a lot going on. So truly you need these thousands and thousands of isotope networks that you have to solve. Do you ever watch one of these movies and think that if the mass of the down quark had been a little bit different, uh, it would have been a very, very different story and this is evidence for the universe being fine-tuned? Oh my gosh. Oh. I don't know about the fine tuning piece of it, but uh, but yes, if if uh, if the nuclear properties were different, things might have looked completely different. And that and you know who knows uh, if yeah. we'd be here <laughs> in this way to discuss it. But yeah, I, I mean this I think about a lot actually because nuclear astrophysics is truly special in some ways. Or this is just my bias too. Please that it's truly interdisciplinary. It's truly a lot of trying to figure out uh, properties of nuclei and particles and exactly how um, those will translate into the making of elements in this whole range of possible astrophysical conditions. Um, and, you know, when, I, when I'm doing a supernova simulation, yes, this is a very large scale event, right? Like... Uh, a star tens in, of uh, ten times the mass of the sun, or twenty times the mass of the sun, but it's coming down to the neutrino matter interactions, <laughs> right? yeah. and that's kind of a funny connection between uh, the scales of these things. To think about well, there's a kind well. of yeah. intricacy about it. A kind of you know the the line of stable nucleides doesn't go on forever. We don't have you know right. a nucleus yeah, that has ten thousand uh, nucleons in it, but it goes up 
pretty far and it seems yeah, really. like almost a little delicate if things were different it wouldn't even go up that far so uh, i i do you know think it's at least worth wondering about why the laws of physics allow for that kind of richness yeah yeah for sure um and speaking of this is just something um you know i get a lot uh people ask whether there are even heavier elements in space that we have not found on earth yeah maybe and, and? <laughs> uh, I, my answer is usually like, this is a nuclear physics problem to some extent, you know, like uh, it's, it's not just that we're not looking hard enough, uh, whether an element can exist or not is a nuclear physics problem. And so when you get to truly, truly heavy elements, then you, then you have to start to figure out, I mean, some people think there's maybe uh at 150 uh, protons or something, there's an yeah. island of stability where super heavy nuclei can exist. But uh, if those are made somewhere in the universe, then it's the question of can we observe them? And but but I guess even if you, even if they did exist, you you may have already given us a reason to expect that they're not that abundant, right? Because yeah, the, exactly. the elements you yeah. make, you have to get there step by step. And if there's a gap in between, yeah. then it is an island you can't get to. Yeah, exactly. So it's it's like a, a truly interdisciplinary kind of figure out the nuclear physics, figure out the environments in which this nuclear physics has to be applied, and then figure out if we can even expect to tell what is right. going on just from, <laughs> uh, you know, the ways in which astronomers gather information through photons, through gravitational waves, through neutrinos uh, and abundances. Yeah. Okay, so I don't want to forget to ask, because you mentioned neutron star, neutron star mergers. Those are obviously very important, but also neutron star black hole mergers. Yes. And again, just the super naive thing is, why doesn't the neutron star fall into the black hole? <laughs> <laughs> it's, it's not at all naive, because that is what happens most of the time. <laughs> okay, good. So, so it's, uh, that one's a bit more um, kind of... Uh, we have not really observed uh, nucleosynthesis signature from those, I would say. Um, it's it's kind of an idea where it's possible to do nuclear synthesis. And the way that would work is the black hole and the neutron star mass would have to be sort of close-ish to each other. So the mass, uh, the mass of the black hole can't be so large that it swallows up the neutron mm. star hole. Um, and then... Uh, it also depends on if the black hole is spinning and uh, uh, all of these things together and the equation of state of the neutron star. And so sort of the mass ratio of the black hole neutron star binary, the equation of state of the neutron star, which is the mass radius relationship of the neutron star, as well as the spin of the black hole, come together to say whether a black hole can disrupt a neutron star as it's approaching for merger or not. So part of the neutron star will get eaten, but part of it may get tidally disrupted and settle in an accretion disk around the black hole. And there you can make heavier elements, maybe? Yes. And there you can, uh, over time, uh, eject part of the accretion disk and make heavier elements. So there's a lot of ways to make heavier elements. And I guess the last one that I know of that we haven't mentioned yet is through cosmic rays. Cosmic rays, yes. So I I usually think of cosmic rays as producing lithium, beryllium, and boron. Okay. That's and I very guess, possible. Yeah. <laughs> so they make so so I mean I shouldn't I, I, I said heavier elements, but I meant heavier than hydrogen. Um, oh heavier than so, hydrogen, yes, yes. Okay, so, so some of our spallation. elements are made yeah. by spallation, I guess. Yeah, but not, yeah, not the super heavy ones, not the ones heavier than iron. Yeah, yeah, that's right. So I guess to kind of recap our our discussion so far, yeah. it would be um, hydrogen, helium, and a tiny bit bit of lithium in the Big Bang. Uh, and then the rest of the lithium, uh, beryllium and boron in cosmic rays, spallation processes. So this is just where cosmic ray protons mostly are breaking apart nuclei of carbon and oxygen in the inter uh, uh, stellar medium. And so then, um, then there's still questions. So, okay, lithium, maybe some of it comes from a particular type of uh, eruption called novae and not really... So th there's always questions when it comes to specific elements, uh, where they come from. So, okay, 
we've got our Big Bang, we've got our cosmic respiration, and then stars. So now you have carbon and oxygen and nitrogen and everything, maybe even up to silicon uh, and up to iron. And then uh, in the supernovae, really, uh, most of the star's core, even if it has made iron, turns into a neutron star or it gets once again broken up. So the iron that comes out in the supernova is not really uh, the iron that was made during the life of the star. So explosive nucleosynthesis, right. burning off silicon to iron happens, burning of oxygen to, to silicon, these kind of things. And so you have the iron group of elements. So now you've done with Big Bang, cosmic rays, stars and supernovae, maybe everything up to iron. And then it's the question is, okay, what now? And there this S process in uh, low mass stars uh, does part of the creation of uh, elements heavier than iron and then R process. So these neutron star mergers and neutron star black hole mergers, maybe other kinds of supernovae, it's really not super, super solved um, as a problem. So um, these types of events create the rest. And it would be remiss not to mention that we <laughs> have been trying to create, humans have been trying to create uh, elements too. And so some of the elements are are basically human-made elements, like Berkelium, where I'm sitting right now uh, okay, in good. Berkeley, was created <laughs> here. So, And, okay, I, I guess the, the other thing I wanted to help our listeners with is a feeling of scale. I mean, both in terms of um, a supernova explosion where a lot of these are made, I guess. Uh, let, let's include, is it, sorry, is it correct to include these neutron star merger events in the world of supernovae or are they separate things? Um, they are kind of their own thing, but I think it's fine to include them in, in the sense that it's sort of a dynamic event that's... Okay. Mission big explosions. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. So these big explosions I would I would tend to think of as being located somewhere in the galaxy or someplace like that. How efficient are they at spreading all these heavier elements across a galaxy? Yeah, that's another uh, another sort of area of study almost. So there are relationships that people have tried to derive. Um, depending on how much energy is output in a supernova uh, and how much of the material it can mix in. So the supernova ejecta will mix in. And so there are relationships. So uh, if you have a very energetic, this is, might be intuitive, if you have a super energetic explosion, you can just uh, mix the stuff that you've ejected way farther out than if you have a lower energy explosion. And so... Um, uh, that kind of is this field of galactic chemical evolution where people try to figure out if a supernova goes off, uh, it, you know, if 10 supernovae go off in all these parts of this galaxy, what does the galaxy look like uh, mm. uh, down the line? And I, I guess this is the, uh, also should be obvious, but maybe there are some details that are interesting. Here on Earth, it seems like we have a lot of iron. We even have things like copper and, and nickel and things like that. So yeah. Did these mostly come from exploding stars one way or the other? Yes, yes, that's right. And so then once you start thinking about the Earth itself, uh, it gets a bit messy in terms of now you have to think about, you know, the planets, formation, and and so on. Uh, the When I think about the composition of the solar system, or when I say composition of the solar system and trying to understand that, that really means composition of the sun, <laughs> the planets don't matter, basically. Yeah, because all, all of the mass uh, in the solar system is mainly sitting in the sun. And so um, for the Earth, then the geological processes and uh, things like that begin to matter as well. Okay. And um, like in terms of deciding in which layer of the Earth various elements sit, not in terms of producing new elements. Right. Really. right. Yeah. And uh, well, well, we can wrap up with, I do want to mention again, I did mention the intro, but I'll mention again your TikTok series where you're explaining some of this uh, in a completely different medium. Um, <laughs> but one of the fun things is you not only explain the nuclear astrophysics and the uh, R process, S process stuff, but every element kind of tells a story, right? And you, you certainly given yourself the task of 
having fun <laughs> things to say about strontium and boron and and things like that. I mean, maybe you can yeah, just no. share with us a couple of fun things about your favorite elements. Oh wow! Yes, so I kicked off this series, which is called Stardust, and I'm posting it on TikTok and also on YouTube with strontium. Um, and part of the motivation was because there was in 2017 a detection of a neutron star merger and the light from a neutron star merger. Um, and in that light, one of the elements that astronomers have confidently detected, again, and there's arguments, of course, around every single thing in astronomy, uh, but is the element strontium. And so I, I was thinking about strontium that year a lot <laughs> and it started popping up in places that you wouldn't uh, usually as an astronomer think about. So for example, there's uh, marine organisms that make their skeletons out of strontium sulfates. And okay, I did not know that. <laughs> strontium isotopes can tell you uh, what region a wine came from. So there's varying levels of strontium isotopes in the soil in different parts of the earth. And when uh, plants grow or a, an animal like a mammoth eats, uh, those strontium uh, isotope ratios get encoded in the grapes, for example. Uh, when you make wine out of those grapes, uh, there's the strontium. So um, it's it's... A lot of uh, fields uh, that you wouldn't even think about use these isotopes. So wine fraud can be prevented <laughs> by looking at strontium isotope ratios in your wine. Um, but I would say uh, my favorite one is how you can figure out the region in which a woolly mammoth lived by looking at the, the tusk of the mammoth and the layers in the tusk and the strontium isotopes ratios encoded in those layers. So mammoth tusks grow in layers, like mm -hmm. tree rings almost. And so okay. uh, every layer encodes the ratio uh, of isotopes from the region in which the mammoth was living and eating. What is it specifically about strontium that makes that so useful rather than some other element? Oh, yes. So strontium um, and... I believe rubidium, there's a particular relationship um, in the way these elements decay. So th there's two stable isotopes. I'll have to look at the details because I don't remember off the top of my head, but there's uh, some sort of a relationship between um, the stable isotopes of strontium and the way the decay of other isotopes forms those that makes it mm -hmm. a good tracer of uh, time and region. And things like okay. that. Okay, so something that just yeah, the decay rates the and things yeah. like that. Yeah. So I guess the final question then is that this leads on from that. Um, you already mentioned how interdisciplinary the field is. Like, if, yeah. if there's a young person here who wants to become a nuclear astrophysicist, uh, what is included in the list of things you have to know? I mean, it sounds like there's some particle physics, there's astrophysics, there's uh, I mean, nuclear physics, pretty obviously, and maybe some other things I'm not even thinking of. You know, I'll tell you what first drew me into nuclear astrophysics, and it was listening to a talk where somebody was describing their supernova simulations. And basically, it turns out that to correctly understand a supernova explosion, and this is true of very many things, but especially in this case, it, it becomes very obvious. Um, you need to understand basically all of the types of physics that, uh, <laughs> that uh, exist. So you need general relativity, you need uh, nuclear physics, so you, you actually need to understand like things like uh, quantum uh, as well. And um, then, of course, it's uh, radiation and radiation transport, this kind of thing. And so electromagnetism as well. So it, it kind of just brings everything together into this very complex, messy system. And now you're trying to extract information out of it um, about how stars live and die, as well as how uh, dense matter works, uh, conditions that are not, uh, that we're not able to access here on Earth. What do you have a specific research goal that you're hoping 
comes true over the next number of years? Like, is there a burning <laughs> question you most want to answer? Yes, there's two. So one of the things I'm really trying to understand um, are the transients that come from neutron star mergers. So, um, meaning... so what I mean by that is there's light that is produced when a neutron star merger makes heavy elements. Uh, those elements decay and the radioactive decay of those elements powers um, a light, uh, uh, a signal basically, and it's called yeah. the kilonova signal, similar to a supernova just um, for the merger case. And to truly understand how kilonovae work, you really have to get a handle on every single way a merger could produce material, the properties of the of that material, and then uh, how photons travel through that material. And so this very last piece of doing the multidimensional radiative transfer calculation, sorry for all the, uh, all the jargony no, words, it. but that is what I'm trying to do. And the goal is to really figure out, are neutron star mergers the only source of uh, our process elements? Is, is, is this truly the only site where rapid neutron capture happens or needs to happen to explain um, the abundances of these heavy elements in the universe? Um, my guess would be probably no, but it uh, would be <laughs> uh, it would out. be good to uh, understand. And then sort of from, uh, from in the opposite direction, uh, from the core collapse supernova side, I want to try to understand the properties of um, of the first stars, for example. So it's very difficult to make connections from um, a star that's maybe 20 solar masses all the way to what kind of elements, uh, exactly what amounts of different elements it produced and the type of light curve that you should see. Um, we don't even know if it should necessarily explode or not. So this is one of the big open questions is like, uh, uh, which stars explode and which right. don't? And so hopefully by understanding the chemical signatures of, of explosions, I can try to work towards understanding the properties of the stars that exploded themselves. Well, that should keep you busy for a while. I like that. I won't, <laughs> uh, I won't keep you here any longer with all that on the plate. So Sanjana Kurnas, thanks so much for being on the Mindscape Podcast. Thank you. This was uh, really, really fun.